Good evening. These medals and trophies around me are among the most coveted in Australian football. This is one man's private collection, a sort of personal hall of fame, if you like. That man is Barry Cable. Barry Cable is more than just a champion. He has played 400 games and lasted as long as anyone the code has known. He has won Sandover, Simpson and Tassie medals and played in 33 finals and nine grand finals. He has won club best and fairest awards on eight occasions. It is an imposing, almost unequalled record. But as I said, Cable is more than just a record breaker. It is the way he has done it. He is a living example of all that is good in our Australian game. Superlatives are hard to find to describe his quality and sportsmanship. Perhaps the most famous name in any code of football the world has known is Pelé, the great Brazilian soccer star. Victoria's best known coach, Ron Barassi, has described Barry Cable as the Pelé of Australian football and in this program you will find out why. To those who know him, Cable is affectionately called Cabes. This is the story of Cabes, as told by the players, opponents, coaches and the man himself. I used to run and run and run and run. I loved running when I was young and I believe I may have developed into a champion middle distance runner. I like cycling too and when I was a kid I rode a bike more than 230 miles from Narragin to Perth and back. I also used to box and play tennis. But one day when I was very young, just a teenager in fact, I made a conscious decision. I made up my mind that I was going to be a champion footballer. Plenty of players up. Ian Miller over the centre line. Long kick from Miller towards Cable, and Cable takes the mark. Barry Cable has got to be the most professional thinking and acting footballer I've ever handled and I've ever seen. Barry Cable could have been a four minute miler. I don't think there's any doubt about that. His stamina was unique. Look, I, I, I really believe that I've had the privilege of playing with probably the best big man and the best small man in the history of the game. Uh, the best big man was uh, Graham Farmer and the best small man, without a doubt, is, uh, is Barry Cable. He had, in fact, I believe, radar in his left hand and radar in his left boot. It reminded me, perhaps, of the best analogy I could, I could uh, recall would be Muhammad Ali in a fight. In all the flurry of punches, Muhammad Ali exactly knew exactly where he was, and he landed the telling blows. The same with Cable. He did not land blows, he landed hand passes or foot passes. And Barry Cable was the man who, knew, who remained calm while everything else around him may have been in disarray. I remember Barry Cable, or think of Barry Cable, as probably the greatest exponent of the skills and techniques associated with Australian football. Now, I've always believed that a good big man would beat a good little man, unless he was a superman, and Barry Cable was superman. Well, my own personal rating of Cable is that he is, without doubt, up in the top ten players that probably ever played the game of Australian football. Barry Cable, the uh, Western Australian, coming to Victoria is like um, instant coffee. All you need to do is add a little hot water and you've got uh, the best brew of the, of the lot. A lot of Western Australians come over here and take a long time to adjust, but he is an instant Victorian. Barry Cable was idolised by all the Victorian football fans and I think possibly I may have summed it up correctly when I said he was the little champ and I really meant that. 
Mike Beard behind Barry and got himself Cable. recorded. Oh, this could be a cause for the champion. Well, all our Western Australian friends would love that Barry Cable. Really So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the man himself, Barry Cable. The Pally of Australian football. Well, uh, that's a pretty fantastic title to give a guy, I suppose. Uh, it'd be pretty hard to say that it wasn't so because uh, he's done it for a long while. He's, he's reached magnificent heights and he's had almost flawless skills. And this is what Pelé apparently was about. Pelé must have been a, an absolute wizard and Cable is too. And uh, there's often a, a question asked, isn't there? Who's the greatest handballer? Well, I suppose again, because of the fact that I've been with Caves, uh, I'd put Cable ahead of Farmer. Both great. And Caves probably just a shade ahead, but still ahead. He's a uh, way to make a ball talk. Cable's a, the best ever by a, a good 20% at getting a ball out of a pack in congested positions and knowing exactly what the players were doing, stepping over feet and ducking under shoulders and just encrypt and threading a ball through bodies and gaps that, that no other player would even think of doing. And that all came about because of his enormous amount of time he spent with the ball. But to the player himself out on the ground, it's a tremendously hard job because not only does he have to naturally try to get the ball, which is the key to the game, but it's all the other little things that are involved with football. The fact that when he actually gets hold of the ball that he has to try to break away from the player that he's playing on or he might be in the middle of a pack and he has to get out of that pack either that or he tries to quickly look around to see where a teammate is running past making a hand pass target so that he can hand pass the ball to him or in fact he's just found he's stranded and he's on his own and he's either got to burst out of the pack or he's got to punch the ball out in front of him and then try to get it again and then hand pass it on I hope that whatever I do on the field reflects a lifetime of preparation. People may find this hard to believe, but I started my total dedication to football when I was a small boy. After a school match one day, when I was only 11, a teacher came up to me and said, Cable, you should stick to football. I think you've got the makings of a champion. I never ever forgot that, and I'll never forget the teacher, even though I haven't seen him since. His name was George Tangaris. Barry's whole life to me as an outsider and only one that knew him on a casual basis was simply that he was a man who only thought football, thought football was his life. In fact, he wanted it to be his life. And to that end, he used to obtain a football. He had one. It was, this was enormous size. He wouldn't accept anything else, as I mentioned previously. I doubt very much if I ever saw Barry going along the street without a football in his hand. Now he'd throw this in front of him, he'd bounce it like a normal schoolboy would do with a, a tennis ball. He'd just bounce this, throw it, go along, scoop it up, and then above all, stab kick the ball. He, I have never seen him punt kick or screw punt a ball. There was always seen to be this little drop kicking. But his uh, whole aim, his whole life at that very early age was simply geared towards football. He loved it and he showed this. There were other kids at school who were about his age uh, that were very, very good footballers. But none of them seemed to have his uh, purposeful approach to the game. 
and while the others had uh, the skills of handball and marking and kicking, they didn't have the ability to, the football knowledge. He seemed to have the ability to read a game and he was a past master, even at 13 years of age, at playing a kick behind the game. But the hard cold facts was that when the team was selected one particular weekend, I was left out of the side. And I can remember going up to the coach and asking him, you know, why I wasn't selected in the side. And his words were to me that uh, I was too small and that uh, they just didn't want me to go out in the ground and get injured. Well, you know, that was pretty hard for me to take because I believed that I was better than a lot of the players that were selected in the side. So I can remember I went home crying to my mother and told her that, you know, I wasn't selected because I was too small. And I still felt today that, uh, you know, that it was really tough. Anyway, it never, uh, it never stopped me from still wanting to play and I went back the following week and trained just as hard as anyone else, in fact probably harder, because I was still desperate to want to get into the side and uh, I can always still remember the coach of the reserve side saying that if I didn't get a game the following week, well then he was quite prepared to step down for me. And uh, anyway, I eventually ended up getting a game that particular weekend, played, played well and never looked back from that stage. Barry worried us enormously as a youngster because of his fearlessness, simply because he was instructed not to go and get the ball because of his very small stature at that stage, but he didn't know that. He wouldn't accept that. When I came to Perth at the age of 18, I um, was living with my brother, and my brother told me that uh, if I wanted to do extremely well, he personally felt that uh, most of the players that were playing today and uh, even a lot of athletes generally were a bit soft and he felt that what I really should do is go up, uh, take up some type of Spartan training and his Spartan training was the fact that, you know, in the winter you get up in the morning, you take off your shirt and your singlet and you just run around with just a pair of shorts on uh, outside whether it was raining, whether it was cold didn't make any difference and in the summertime when it was really hot we used to run in the uh, hottest part of the day around about 1.30, 2 o'clock and all I used to do was just naturally have a pair of shorts on, wet a hanky, put it around my neck and I'd probably run say 10 to 15 miles and uh, also during the winter when it was really cold I used to run about the same distance and uh, all this was just naturally a build up for what I, again, what I wanted to do was to be an outstanding player. Cable didn't become a super athlete by accident. It was a well-designed plan, and he was a leader in using weights, in uh, developing his body to a stage where it was an outstanding physique. Cable worked very, very hard as a young man, and I remember at the Somerset Pool, way back in the mid-60s, Cable pushing big weights in a, in a bid to build that upper body that uh, was to become a trademark of his football. One of the weaknesses for a shorter player is the fact that he can't jump very high or naturally mark over taller opponents. And so I got onto these, uh, I went down to the WA University and in fact I did a jump down there, a sergeant jump. A sergeant jump is one where you stand and you face the wall and you put both hands up and then you stretch up as high as you can with both hands and you take the measure from the top of your finger and then you stand sideways to the wall and you use your inside hand and then you leap and from wherever you leap and you touch onto the wall that gives you an idea of exactly how high you can jump and in my particular test I think that I jumped something like 29 inches which was an excellent jump so to even improve on that further or at least keep that same spring in my legs I used to um, when I was working at Master Butchers when I first came down from Narrowge and I was working at Master Butchers in Asquith Street Victoria Park I was in the store out the back and I used to hang a piece of string from the ceiling with a piece of paper on the end and I used to have it uh, approximately 27, 28 inches from, the, from my own head and then every now and again I'd be coming down the passage and I used to just jump up and try to hit it with my head all the time and of course uh, once I hit it all the time I knew that I was getting that distance all the time. Cable's quite good in the air, he hardly ever gets a chance to do it but he can take a very strong overhead mark and he can tackle, I can remember him uh, in this, that state of origin match I, we spoke about, uh, bringing down big Gary Dempsey is now with us. Well, Dempsey must be uh, 16 and a half stone. He, pound for pound, in the North Melbourne gymnasium, he is the strongest player, he was the strongest player at North Melbourne, pound for pound. A lot of people wouldn't realise that. Now that's why he's able to 
survive all these years of you know, buffeting that, that, that a player gets. He, he's very, very strong, compact. When I first went to the, uh, well, first thought of the idea of coaching, and Perth came to my mind, uh, foremost in my mind was the players of the side, and the player that stood out most to me, and was one of the requirements that I accepted the coaching job at Lathlane Park, was Barry Cable. I knew that they were a side that didn't have much purpose in what they did from year to year, and we'd seen the games against them, and I'd seen Cable's brilliance on those occasions, and. I stated to them, that, uh, to the guy who first came to see me and Jack McNamara, that if I was to accept the coaching job at Lathlane Park, then Barry Cable had to be part of that contract. It's an unknown fact, but it was a fact. And to my uh, joy and satisfaction uh, in the next uh, three or four years, uh, he stayed with us and was probably instrumental. Uh, the, most, uh, the player that had the most influence on the team, uh, he... Um, was probably uh, the most single-minded player that you'd come across. He was the most dedicated to perfecting not only his own skills, but um, his whole approach to the game was so enthusiastic that it had to brush off on the other players. But in those days, I thought he was the master on the field with the first side. They were a good side, there's no question about that, and Malcolm Matt was a top leader. But he got value out of the little fella, Cable. He directed the traffic. Those days, he kicked a lot of goals too. He covered more territory, he was a bit younger. But as the years have gone on, they haven't taken toll of Cable. People fail to realise that at 34, 35, whatever he might be, the fitness is there, the constitution is there, and I say he can play for another two or three years. But in answer to your first question, I'd say he was the general, the top man that enabled Perth to win the three premierships. No feat in football that Barry Cable couldn't perform. He's, as a player, I think he's best described that the sort of rebound he had. Now, like I often look at footballers myself, and now uh, you've got they've got certain characteristics. You know, their physical capacity, their strength uh, comes from that. Uh, their skills are something they've developed over the years, uh, which is assisted, as I mentioned earlier, by their uh, coordination and balance their speed, uh, their reflexes. Uh, Cable was cat-like in his reflexes. No, he just did things tremendously quickly.
After playing under two great coaches, Ern Henfrey and Mal Atwell, and after three premierships with Perth, I decided to go to Melbourne. I always knew that sooner or later I would have to go to the VFL to really prove myself. In 1970, North Melbourne was a struggling side, but I tried my best. And I think that it'd be true to say that uh, every week we were probably getting beaten by about 10 goals. And it was Barry Cable who, at the time on, time on period of the last quarter, was still boring into the packs and getting the ball out and doing all those things that you just expect of a champion player. And in that year, I don't think that he was really accepted by the Victorian public. I don't think that he was really accepted by the North Melbourne supporters. Uh, and yet he, he finished fourth in the Brownlow medal. He won the club's best and fairest. And it really took his years from 1973 onwards, which included the 75 and the 77 premierships, for him to get all of the accolades as a footballer that he deserved from the Victorian public. But to me, uh, being closely associated with him, I thought that probably his, his most magnificent year for North was that year that we finished last. I would like to have stayed on at North, but the negotiations with Perth failed and I returned home to Western Australia. At my first attempt at coaching in 1972, we beat Subiaco in the first semi-final, but we went down in the preliminary final. In 1973, we finished seventh. I suppose a lot of people were entitled to say that I had failed. But I look back with some satisfaction because many of those young players who began with me went on to help Perth win two premierships. However, my destiny was in Melbourne. I still had plenty to prove and one of my lasting ambitions was to play in a grand final at the MCG. To me, a VFL final was like a runner taking part in the Olympics or a test cricketer playing at Lords. At age 31, I returned to North Melbourne. Well, it was one of the miracles of the game, really, to come into Australian rules football in Victoria it, at that age, and at the, more or less at the final part of his career, and still prove to the thousands and thousands of supporters from all clubs just what skill and aptitude would, can do to, to, for a player. A lot of players have talent, not many of Cable's talent, I'll, I'll admit that, but these players with great talent, they still have trouble lifting, whereas Cable, that's, he could do it so easily. Well, it mightn't have been easy, nothing's easy, I suppose, but he could do it so consistently, lift when the occasion was needed. If you're in trouble at, at half-time and uh, Cable had, had, you know, what was perhaps for him an average half, you just give him a couple of needles and uh, not as a long type. <laughs> Uh, and away he'd go, he was just enormous at rising. Occasionally, he'd have an average quarter or half and we could say a few things which would uh, challenge him and uh, he'd get up and go if he wasn't going to do that already anyway. So Cable, you know, epitomises what a coach is on about anyway because he's, the coach is on about a player expressing to the utmost his talent uh, with fierceness desire to win and desire to do the whole thing to the best of his ability and how he did that perfectly so if, if you're asking did he translate my thoughts well you'd have to say yes but they're the thoughts of any dedicated person anyway uh, and of course he was that but boy if you had 18 cables probably 18, if you had 18 blokes his size He'd probably win the match anyway. His ability to read the game was outstanding. Um, his reflexes, his football in Melbourne. I watched, I watched him on television and I was often critical of, of Brassie. I don't believe he... I think he asked Cable to do too much, but if that's possible, Cable did exactly what Brassie asked of him and did it perfectly. But I think he could have made Bra uh, Cable's job a bit lighter as Cable was thrown in amongst the big fellas. He was a sort of player who had to get under the packs. He got the ball out, he got it out perfectly. But uh, in the, his era with Perth, he was able to have 
to use the ball, I thought, from the kicking point of view, more often. He wasn't expected to do the heavy work that he did in Melbourne. I'm sure that uh, it's proven over the last few years when he was topped off by a great coach in Ron Barassi, who I've uh, always idolised also, and uh, I'm delighted to know maybe I uh, wasn't such a, a great coach to uh, get the best out of Coase, but I'm glad that he did play under Ron Barassi because uh, it brought two champions together and uh, they've proven over the last five years that uh, what a champion's all about and that's why they've got the results they have. Cable, of course, went to the VFL, proved himself there. I think he may have been fortunate to go to a side uh, such as North Melbourne that had uh, a dictatorial coach as uh, Ron Barassi to be able to instil uh, greater challenges into Cable. This again brought out uh, determination. It brought out the, the man in Cable to make him uh, probably one of the best footballers that North Melbourne have ever seen. So Cable is certainly right up in the tops as far as Rovers go. I mean, there's not many uh, peers in Victorian football as a rover that uh, uh, Cable hasn't uh, beaten. I've seen Barry Cable play some great games. Mind you, he was in a great side, North Melbourne, because they've been winning matches every week. But I think possibly the biggest thing about Barry Cable was that he played his best football under pressure and when North Melbourne really needed him. He used to excel when the side was going badly. He was a player with a, a drop kick breaking away from the pack that would lift the entire side. And I think this magnetism or this charisma that he had made him such a great player. Cable was one of those sort of players that us opposing coaches had great problem uh, talking about right throughout the week. We knew once he got the ball, the next kick would go to uh, one of the North Melbourne players. He just set up so many things for them. Somehow or other, whenever we saw Barry Cable, it was usually in a big pressure game, he really came to the fore and would be one of the best three players on the ground in nearly all those big pressure games. And, you know, I think this is the thing with the coaches that uh, we would put so much emphasis on cutting off Barry Cable, putting extra pressure on him, making certain that you uh, didn't let him get away by himself and because he just meant so much to his particular side. Two games that I, I actually saw him play, one against us and one against Carlton in two final series, one in 1977, a preliminary final, when I think he had something like 37 possessions against us at 35 or 34 years of age against what I've called two top-class rovers that we happened to have at the time in our side. I think that with a preliminary final against Carlton, I think the year before, it might have been 1976, which I thought was the best individual game of football that I've ever seen from any player in any competition. Um, the, the, I can't remember, it was a final at the Waverley ground, I think in 1976, and he just controlled the game at both ends, and he was the prime mover for the whole of the game in a way that I've never seen another player take over a match. Ball not clear here by Armstrong. Cable comes in for the race, but Byrne of Carlton comes in. Over they go. Oh, Cable almost cut the beauty. Oh, golly. She's pretty tough. The ball is trapped there by Armstrong. He runs into trouble. Cable picks the ball up. Cable tries to uh, get it forward now under his own steam. He gets it to the half forward flank. He's looking for Greg. Players all flying for the ball. McClure stays down. He's grabbed. It comes back to O'Connell. He kicks the ball off the side of his boot. Couldn't get away with it. Taken there by Gumbelin. He hand passes over to Henshaw. Henshaw to Cable. Cable going for a run around that eastern flank now. Eventually takes his kick. It's a nice kick too. Down towards the weak position. And up goes Jessalenko. The ball not clear. In comes Cable of North Melbourne. Cable tries one up to the half forward flank. Looking for Cowton. Kekovic and Jones. But in comes Cowton from behind. Plenty of bustling. Cable's on top of the ball. But there'll be a ball up. The North get another one here. Here's the bounce. Kekovic comes in and gets a tap away too, but it's taken there by Pickett. He's taken to the ground by uh, Cable. Pickett's uh, still going. There's the bounce. Nolan gets his hand to the ground towards Cable. Cable drives north forward once again. Here's a chance. It's a terrific game. Here's Nolan coming in there with Jones. It's tapped down to uh, Cable. Beautiful one from uh, Nolan. He gets it up to uh, the half forward flank. It's a beautiful kick, in fact. Plenty of North Melbourne players there, but the Carlton players knock it away. But it's Cable coming in. Cable, a perfect hand pass. Hits Keith Gregg right on the chest. Gregg doesn't want to fool around too much. Back towards Cable. Oh, I told you they didn't want to fool around too much. 
Jones and Moore knocked out by Nolan. A beautiful one yeah. to Cable to and Cable. Look at him go. There's Moore trying to get it back to Cable. Cable picks it up nicely. A hand pass coming back. And we see David Dench take the ball back towards that half forward line. Up goes Byrne with Mangles. Coming through there is Peter Chisnell. But Mangles foils him. Coming through is Cable. Cable gets a free kick out of all this. Got one in the back. Barry Cable of North, he tries a short out here, he's looking for Burns. Oh. Nolan's hardly been off the ball, Nolan got it out. There's Cable, playing a great third quarter for North Melbourne. Out it goes, punched away by Dool. The pressure on Carlton now, little Cable once again. And a hand pass to, uh, to Greg, Greg's got the ball, he spins out of his opponent's way nicely. Back to Cable, Play. there's the little champ and a pass, no Dawson dropped it. Cable's going in after it again. Dill puts him out of position. Moore drives it forward. It's taken by Cable. Cable takes a bit of a bounce. Eventually kicks up towards a half-forward flank as North start to storm home. But they've got to keep it going. It goes to Cable. Cable into the forward zone. Cable now coming along this eastern side by the look of things. He's looking for Keith Gregg. It goes over Burns head and Gregg takes the mark. And Shaw gets the hand pass over to Cable now, but he's in trouble, but he breaks away. He's played a champion second guard to half and a mark to burn. It's difficult to pick out something in a way because he just did it so often. I suppose there was the Peruni final in 1977, which as we all know that, that match is a, a cutthroat match, so the loser drops out. And we're playing Hawthorne, our mortal enemies in VFL football. And he was playing against Matthews, who's you know, a, a great player. And he finished up having 16 kicks, 22 handballs, and I think three goals. And it was just an unbelievable match. It was one of the, one of the greatest matches I've ever seen. Dangerous, he goes out towards Matthews. Here's Dangerous for North Melbourne. Matthews picks it up. He's taken not in position. No free kick, going the other way. Free kick, North Melbourne's way. Be taken by Henshaw, no Barry Cable. Tap down goes Scott's way. Very scrambly football. Off on defenders smothering the ball. Free kick has been picked out, it's going North Melbourne's way to Barry Cable. This will be the first score of the match, you can bet on that. Cable's about 30 metres out. Angle is not very acute. And Barry Cable, well, we all know what a magnificent player he is. Can he kick accurately? I would say a score is a certainty, but with it will it, with it, will it be a major one. It's a magnificent kick by Cable, it's fair. Shimabus gets the ball out to Tanner. His kick as touch as it goes in towards that uh, McCarthy. There's a go from uh, Cable over to Blighty. Fires, it just looks all right. And they're looking for Henshaw, fumbles it. Going to be a bit of trouble here, get it back to Cable again. Oh, beautiful hand pass to Wells. He had him spun it before he even got the ball that time. As the ball goes out towards that half-back line for North. Beautiful play by Cable. Over to uh, Payton. Another hand pass. We see the ball driven up towards that full forward zone. And a mark taken there by uh, Cable. No doubt about that. He's played pretty well this first quarter too. Whatever this guy does is right. Oh, Helwin trying to get it out to Matthews, but he's in trouble. Cable doing a great job. A beautiful hand pass to Blight. It looks good. And that was Cable's goal. No doubt about that. Back towards full four towards Hendry. Just now for Cable if he's fast enough. In trouble, but the little master does it beautifully. Towards the half-forward line and turn, boots towards the centre wing, beautiful pass. Back towards the half-forward line it goes, Hendry in front, over the back is Cowden. 
And Cowden takes the mark. Handball in turn. They got it to Handball's confidence. Here's Barry Cable streaming towards the half forward line. What's the pass like? There's Cable once again. This little fella's getting himself balanced so he can give it to someone. And he does. Cable. Cable in trouble. Goes to Handball. Oh. Beautiful Handball. Oh. Back towards Cable. He'll get clear. Give a hand pass. Here's Cable again. Out towards the boundary line. It goes in the back pocket. Cable. Handball. And Cable scouting out well. And intelligent play. He tapped it over to Cowton. Back to Sutton now. Doesn't know where to go. Back to Cable. A mark to Little Casson. Right on the band. On a quick pass coming over to Cable. And North Melbourne are looking good at the moment. Pushed out now. Nearly a free kick. Well picked up by Cable. A beautiful hand pass over to Shimabus. The North Melbourne defence is standing up pretty well. There's the little champ, Cable, streaking away. Oh, he's outpointed Billy Pickin again. Handball's in a flash. Chance now for Cable. Lines up. Bangs for goal. He's going to run for an open go. He'll have a hand pass. Over to Cable, there he is, fire for the goals. Punched away by uh, Keenan, pushed away that time by uh, Cowton over to Cable, a beautiful hand pass. Gordon over the back, neither able to make it, Keenan can't break clear. Chance and turn for Byrne, across towards Cable, little fellas off, stops for goal. He's put it through, I'd say. Yep. Well, Cable not only adjusted so well and so quickly, but he contributed, he was an instant contributor too. We've had players contribute to our game here, people from interstate, the Stewarts from, and Bulldogs from Tasmania and Polly Farmer from, from Western Australia, Farmer with his 30 metre hand pass and of course Stewart uh, attacking the ball, the wet ball coming off the turf and Bulldog with his wonderful skills uh, and his right and left handedness and these sort of things. Cable had something to contribute too and that was his hand passing, his, his uh, multi-level hand passing, right and left hand. He could squirt a ball between your legs or over the top, over his left shoulder, um, just to, to initiate the game. That and his very quick kick, his instant kick from the centre. And this is something North haven't recovered from. They've not been able to find the player to replace that instant kickoff that Cable gave them. And this is one of their demises at the moment. When he first arrived, I remember initially at North Melbourne when they were a struggling side with not too many top players, it took a long while for the players around him to complement his ability. And the uh, reasoning that Cable did things so quickly and so well that often other players hadn't been able to anticipate the quickness of the ball would come or the direction in which it would come and unfortunately it would end up not only making the player sometimes look foolish who was receiving it but unfortunately for Cable also that a lot of his work was not complimented or finished off in the way that it probably should have been. He's Im definitely improved a player's performances and he's also caught players out because in a lot of times he's been thinking too far ahead and and uh, naturally those players haven't been up with him and uh, he's probably made them look a little bit silly in some cases because uh, he's been too far ahead of them. Particularly with his, his handball, you know, when a player reads a ball off the pack, as, as he does, um, he's thinking ahead as he grabs the ball and ready to give the handball out and the player running by often isn't aware of his uh, thinking up the field. Hi, Hi, honey. Let's get in this mob today. Yes, Jack. Yes, Jack. Don't shoot. Don't, Johnny. Bill. He's a bit of a freak, uh, Cable, in that uh, he's dedicated. He must have, he must really love football to dedicate himself to put his mind and his body and his whole soul into football for such a long time. I don't know how old he is, but he looks fitter now than he did when he was quite younger. Uh, he can last long periods on the ball. He can be buffeted around and take knocks. And this is a great credit to his physical fitness and the fact that he must work on himself physically through the off-season. But also a credit to his, his psychological and his mental fitness. Anyone who wants to do that for so long must really love the caper and must really have a talk to himself now and again. His inner secrets on how he can motivate, self-motivate and self-drive. Barassi has 
summed him up as the perfect professional. And, uh, he, the, and the fact that he didn't have to really wind him up and let him go. He, he was already wound up. All he had to do was face him in the right direction. When I first went to Mer uh, Melbourne, Barry came at the same time. And we got to know Barry and Helen very well. And during that pre-season training summer, I spent a lot of time with Barry, who then showed the, the professional attitude and learnt me to, and showed me also, uh, what football would be like in Melbourne. Uh, he certainly showed me probably how to have a professional attitude. Hopefully, uh, since those days, uh, what Barry has said to me has rubbed off through the line. Caves would get into our rooms after training and handball the, a wall trying to put it through a circle for say 15 to 20 minutes every night just uh, trying to become more skillful than he was a lot of players don't do that we're trying to do it now we're spending more time on our skills to, tr to be more skillful i think cable was years ahead of his time as far as skills learning was concerned and barry cable was a, was a person in fact who could uh, pretty well drive you mad with his uh, with his football he would uh always have a football in his hand and he'd be always doing something with it and, and if uh, if you walked into the into the rooms and he was in there with a the football you'd you'd better watch out because from any angle he would try to handball a ball to you or kick it to you or when you're not expecting it so you know doing the unexpected things because he said that these sort of things happen out in the ground we, we never at any stage felt that we were at a stage where we still couldn't learn more and that was the idea of putting in these handball machines and uh, we we're always handballing as a matter of fact uh, I'm very interested to have a go now just to see if I can actually still either reach or actually put it through the hole still. That's a better one. That's one out of two. That's two out of three, it's gradually improving. We used to do this quite often and we'd be going on and on and on. And there was always the one that was over the top that we always used to try, to try to get it right over the top, because I felt after a while it was too easy getting it through the big, the, uh, the big one. So what we used to try and do is get it over the top and I might have a try. He was a remarkable footballer. What I liked about him more than anything, 
he kept on improving until I would say he's still improving, he's trying to improve and that's something that our footballers get to a certain part and they refuse to try and improve themselves. His handball was terrific, his stab passing, glorious to watch, it's going out of football. I wish there was a few more coming back like Cable into it. But uh, he's one that uh, could read a game, he had everything. The only thing that uh, I'd say uh, being a bit hostile towards him is that uh, he, you couldn't uh, you couldn't learn anything off him. He was too good. He was like Bradman. You couldn't learn off Bradman, and I, I think you couldn't learn anything off Cable because it was only Cable could do those things. My opinion is really formed further by making a film for the National Football League of Cable and various players around Australia, and over a four-day period, six hours a day, Cable and myself kicked and hand-passed for the complete six hours for the four days. And I thought to myself, well, here's a person at 34 years of age or 35 at that stage, still having a ball in his hand and working on his left and right foot disposal and his left hand and right hand disposal. Now that is the epitome of a person who is striving for success after he had had at least a 20 year career already. He's been prepared right throughout his whole career to p try and perfect, you never, you never perfect anything, but he has been prepared to put the time and the effort, not just in getting himself fit, but in handling a football, in knowing just which way the ball's going to bounce, kicking with the uh, utmost accuracy, uh, mainly with the left foot, but he's capable of also using his right foot. His handball, he perfected that by working at it day after day after day, hour after hour. And you know, young players today expect to just come along to training and develop those skills without really putting in the time and effort. And Barry Cable has been an object lesson to every young player, uh, just how you Im improve your game and work on your game. He became a very dominant hand passer of the ball. He went into the pack and got the ball himself and he got the ball out which he became a very important cog in the North Melbourne wheel so he changed from being a brilliant player and actually receiving the ball and taking it down the field and breaking the opposing sides up with his tremendous kicking ability he then became a very creative player and a courageous player who went into the packs and got the ball himself and then started the North Melbourne team game flowing with his very dynamic and bullet-like passing of the handball. He could kick magnificently and uh, strangely enough, he used drop kicks a lot, which are, is a rare thing in Victorian football. He was a magnificent hand pass, and I don't think I've seen a player read a game as well as Barry Cable. To me, he's one of the greatest players ever to come out of Western Australia. And as a matter of fact, I compare his handball, and uh, this is saying a lot, mind you, with uh, the great Polly Farmer, who I thought was the best handball I've ever seen in my life until Barry Cable came over here. One of the hallmarks of Barry Cable's football, of course, was the left foot drop kick. And he honed that out also at the Somerset Pool over in Victoria Park. And if you went over there any day, he would be prepared to bet you that of 10 drop kicks, he would average 60 yards, and the best would be over 65 yards. And in those halcyon days of cable, when he won three Simpson medals on the trot in grand finals, it was his drop kicking that stood out. And when, as a pressman, you were in the press box and cable grasped the ball on the half forward flank, and ran for goal. You immediately picked up your pen and marked down the goal because that's how it happened. I was always been a fairly outspoken sort of a player but it was mainly brought about because I was a very enthusiastic sort of a person. I really believed in my ability and at times uh, the newspaper or the media would ask me certain questions and naturally I'd give it what I believed was a very honest and true answer. Now it didn't sound very good when it was put down in print on paper and it certainly didn't come over all that well maybe on radio and TV. But I really tried to answer the questions as I believed was right for me to answer them. And for example, they would come out and say, well, you know, do you consider yourself a, a good kick? And I would naturally say, yes, a very good kick, because I really did, I believe that. Or they might say, uh, well, they might have said at that time, are you a fast player, are you quick? And I'd naturally say, yes. Or they'd say, uh, do you believe that you've got very good reflexes? And again, I would naturally say, yes, because I really believed it. Now, it didn't sound very good, I know, because a lot of people thought I was a bit of a big head. And at that time, uh, Muhammad Ali, then Cassius Clay, was uh, boxing at that time, and he was very outspoken. 
and uh, I ended up getting the name of Cassius Cable. Cable, as you can remember, when he was very young, he had a reputation of, they uh, used to call him Cassius, and um, while uh, he was only young, and I think the media set him up at times, but uh, the great thing about Cable, whatever he predicted, uh, came off, I can recall, in, uh, when Perth were winning the 66, 67, 68 grand final side, I'd seen him before the game, and say, uh, how would we go? And he always had the sort of phrase, no worries, and I'll win the Simpson medal. Well, you know, history knows that he won those three Simpson medals, and uh, with a normal person, you think that he was bragging, but you knew that what he'd say he could do, he'd do, and he uh, won those Simpson medals, and he'd always predict when he would win them. And he's humble in victory, uh, as humble as Cable is, I mean. Perhaps I should explain that. Uh, Cabes is true to, him, true to himself, and often feels good about things and says it. But it's not really boastfulness at all. Sometimes he's misconstrued in that area. I think he's got the right attitude to, to winning. He's, he is humble there. One night socially he said to me, he said, well, he said, uh, now that you've cleared me, he said, I think I'll win this uh, premiership off Perth in 1978. And I didn't think that was going to happen, but uh, when grand final game day came and uh, we were playing East Perth, I had that little bit of worry about Cable because he's a born winner and as history showed, uh, they won the premiership by two points and that's just one, another, one of the things that Cable could, could predict. And it's been taken as the siren has gone. The siren has gone to win the 1978 grand final look and look at them. There's Barry Cable, East Perth the winners, the final score, East Perth 11-15-81 to Perth's 12-7-79, the most magnificent finish to a grand final you could possibly imagine. And there's Barry Cable. Well, everyone loves a hero, and Barry Cable is just that. Oh, he looks very, very satisfied, does Barry Cable. Cable on the track, uh, occasionally will do a, a fantastic thing. That's fantastic because it's perhaps difficult at the time he's been off balance, so he's had a, just a split second to see it, a target and uh, polishes off the work and he looks around you know. wasn't it fantastic not not in a boastful way at all but he's got such a charge out of what he's done and I know how he feels in that area not, not that I was in that class of skill at all but it, it gives you a charge and that's for people who don't uh, follow sport they don't understand that a sportsman can get a tremendous high out of one just piece of action that takes him there and he feels magnificent, he feels probably a god and Cable, even after all these honours, occasionally would do things that would make him feel that way. The week preceding our grand final Ron Barassi invited him back on the Thursday night to talk to the players and on that night he also invited down from Queensland a guy that was involved in a rowing uh, race for the, I think it was the 1976 Olympics. And this uh, rower told the story of how this uh, particular rowing team had trained for four years to get a medal. All they wanted to do was win a medal at the Olympic Games for Australia. And uh, he was telling all of our players this on the Thursday night and uh, told of how hard they'd trained and how dedicated they'd been and in the finish he said to our guys and the, the race was conducted and against all odds this particular Australian rowing team got up and finished third and of course they won the bronze medal and that was the story that they'd achieved what they set themselves to achieve in these Olympic Games by bringing a bronze medal back to Australia. And after this guy had given his speech, the next guy up to talk to the players was Barry Cable. And he said, uh, Cable's opening remarks to our players were, well, if I'd have been in that boat, we would have won the gold medal. And of course, everybody laughed. But when Lloyd Hollyoak at the end of the Thursday night session, which was a warm-up for the grand final, got up. I think he summed it all up and he said, when Barry Cable said that uh, if he'd have been in the boat, we, they would have won the gold medal, Barry Cable wasn't joking. 
Another match would be the f original State of Origin match, the first one. And I can remember seeing Cabes after our grand final, which we'd won in 1977, and uh, he played very well. It was a great win, and uh, three days later, he, he was saying to me, we'll beat you, coach. And I didn't think that was going to be so. I was coach of the Victorian type side at the time, but I knew he'd play well, because I'd heard him have the state, same sort of things with the same intensity and certainty about his own play, and I knew he'd play well, and he was magnificent, he was best on the ground. Ian Robertson bouncing the ball, the breeze in favour of WA at the moment, a sou'wester blowing towards the Perth end of the ground, Cable in there trying to get it away, and he's been paid the kick. Barry Cable running towards the centre, he's in trouble, gets it out to Monteith. Out to Barry Cable, a hand pass, up goes the blonde bombshell, look at that hand pass, straight to Campbell. Campbell in trouble, he gets it out further afield to Reed. Reed back to Cable is good football. Plenty of players up, over the back is Cable, Cable over the oh. bench, fourth goal of Western Australia, over towards Featherby, Featherby on the boot into no man's land, oh Cable's there, outnumbered, play on to the umpire, Dill gives it out. Out it comes towards the flank. Schimmelbush is down there. Cable battling. Victoria takes the kick. Well, a great solo effort from Barry Cable. Fumbling the ball, and of course, they're more confident than the Westerners. That's beautiful play by Cable over to uh, Max Richardson. Basil Campbell, good football. Out to Monteith, to Cable. In they go. Peter Featherby. WA with a break now through Cable. There's no beg your pardons there at the moment. Magro out to Cable. Look at the hand pass from Cable to Max Richardson. Ian Miller over the centre line. Long kick from Miller towards Cable, and Cable takes the mark. Through comes Cable. Well picked up by oh. Cable. Great pass to Bell Valley. Picked up by Magro to Cable. Good and holding the ball, and the kick going to Barry Cable. Great tackle from Barry Cable. Bill Baum in the centre of the ground. Gives it to Cable, it's dangerous, but he gets out of it. A good oh. pass, Featherfield. Beautiful pass from Beautiful. Cable. Hand passes to Cable. Table, plenty of time there to get rid of it. Puts it further afield to Glenn Denning. Well taken by Magro, it's smothered. Well smothered by Duell. Look at that desperation on the part of players there. As they go in, Cable fighting for the ball. Big pack up. Cable waiting down. Look at the hand pass from Cable to Reed Into Sheedy, number 10. His kicker, shocker. Barry Cable, brilliant play, Cable. Gosh, he's played superbly today. Up goes Alexander, taken by Cable, over towards centre half forward, here's a chance for George Young. George Young about 20 metres out, he's on his wrong foot, he's right foot towards goals, and the 13th goal to WA. But uh, as we know with Victorian sides, if they click, they'll click brilliantly. Cable once again, ball up towards half forward. Well done Robert Flower, but he can't get away with it, Cable's there, Cable picks it up, gives it over Ooh. to Hunter. Hand pass to Cable, look at the hand pass from Glenn Denning to Cable, Cable back to Glenn Denning. Well, 118 plays 49, Western Australia in front, Cable, brilliant hand pass. Goes in and does it himself when Reed couldn't take it. Superb play, Barry Cable, right up to full forward, and there it is, that's the way you play football. He gives it further, further, Dempsey, and look at that tackle from Cable! <laughs> oh, what a tackle, and that's the way uh, WA have tackled all day. But it was very interesting in 1964, I remember being interviewed by, I, I'm pretty sure it was Sid Donovan, and he did ask me a few questions like, uh, what were my ambitions? And my ambitions at that particular time was winning another Sandover medal, captaining Western Australia, playing in a premiership side, playing over 350 games, or in fact trying to beat Jack Sheedy's uh, Australian record at that particular time, or beating the Perth club record, which was 250 games. And of course, it's now nearly 18 years, or 16 years, since that uh, interview. And of, I can uh, now happily say that uh, I didn't only win one more Sandover medal, I ended up winning two more. I played in, I've played in something like about six winning grand finals now. I have captained Western Australia, and I've certainly played a lot more games than 356 at that time that Jack Sheedy held the Australian record. So uh, it doesn't sound so bad now, but I appreciate at that time 16 or 18 years ago, it possibly sounded as though I was a bit egotistical and I certainly had a swollen head. But I'm very happy to say that at least to this point of time, I have proved those points.
Cable's fitness was another great example to players. He had that uncanny ability of uh, being able to, to come from sort of adverse conditions to be fit on a Saturday afternoon to play uh, his game of football every week. You know, where another player in many cases would have not gone out. Cable never considered that he wouldn't be available. He was a super confident player in this respect. Um, he, um, his injuries, well, I can't remember him missing a game at Lathlane. There were, were a few, but they, they were so far and few between, you just didn't remember. The, it was an unheard of sort of, thing, sort of thing that Barry Cable wouldn't be in the team. My biggest impression of Barry, of course, treating him as his tremendous recuperative powers and his ability to uh, suppress injury mentally. He has uh, no concern whatsoever for injury as regards pain, only if it is structurally important. If he feels that uh, it has no structural problem, he uh, eliminates and mentally suppresses the pain aspect where he can perform to top level and a lot of his best games have been with a degree, considerable degree of pain that probably no one would know about. And I think he's probably, and I said totally prepared, and I meant that, not only in the skills and techniques, but in his physiological capacities to see the game through. It's a credit because a guy of that size, um, who wasn't so fast over the ground as terribly quick with the things he did, he certainly was terribly quick, but he was not a fast runner in the true sense of the word, should have been nailed a lot more often. And probably if he'd been nailed a lot more often, then he wouldn't have seen the distance out, would never have got to the 400. But do, you know, another, another thing in his favour is he has an incredible um, ability to survive and very rarely, I can think of Lee Matthews getting him over in uh, Western Australia in one state game, but the number of times that he got clobbered when he was in the wrong spot at the wrong time doing the wrong thing, probably you could count on one hand. In 400 games, that's an incredible ability to be able to size up the situation and do the right thing most of the time. For his size, uh, I'd say he'd be one of the most courageous players I've ever seen. He'd be in the bottom of the pack trying to get the ball out, give it to players going past. He received plenty of hard knocks over in Victoria and here. I remember one game against the uh, West Australians when Lee Matthews bowled him over. Um, you know, eyes on the ball at all times. That's, that was his main object, the ball. Anywhere the ball was, Barry Cable was. He was motivated, he applied himself. And most of all, he had tremendous courage. He was never frightened to put himself in front of a pack or in front of a bigger player than himself. And when he got the ball, he did something with it all the time. I wouldn't last a week out there these days because there's no communication between umpires and players anyway from what I could see. But Barry Cable, who has been all over Australia and played against the best of them, and being a star footballer has been the target of many hard and unnecessary thumps behind the ears, shirt fronts and what have you. And he's a great example to any youngster to see the way he jumps off the ground, does not argue with the point with the umpire, gets on with the game, and that's why people from all over Australia come and watch the players of the calibre of Barry Cable. Cable, a sportsman, deserves to be put on the same level as his ability. That's on the highest possible pedestal. He's got a fierce attitude to winning and I've never ever seen him do anything outside the rules. He may have, I mean let's face it, he's played 400 games so he, occasionally he may have slipped off his pedestal for a split second uh, but I've never seen it and uh, now he's, and this is another reason why he'd certainly be up there in the greats of Australian sporting history. How do you do justice to a player that is rated by you know, Western Australia and Victoria and Australia as one of the greatest footballers of all time. Uh, he had unlimited stamina. He had the potential to be a superstar in any sport he might like to make his, uh, his life. He made football and I think that Australia, uh, the Perth Football Club, East Perth, North Melbourne and uh, the Australian public have been very, very lucky to see this fellow dedicate himself uh, to being the player that he is, not, off, not, on, not, as, well, not as, as he is on the ground as well as off the ground. He was a great player on that field, but he's also been a great man off the field. He's got two great things in his life, football and his family. Billy Goggin might be a bit upset by saying that I think Barry Cave was a better player than him. He, B Billy Goggin was a an excellent rover and I played with Billy for 11 seasons down at Geelong and he to me he made me as a full forward 
Barry Cable had a lot more going than Billy, and in fact he could do a lot more things. He was a greater exponent of the handball and could bring other players into the game. Billy was a bustling sort of a player that would get in and get the ball and do it himself uh, and uh, do the hard work himself. Now ba Barry Cable can do that as well, but he, then he could finish it off. I think he could finish it off much better. Skilton again. Skilton was uh, very, very close to a Barry Cable that we had here in Victoria. But uh, to me, Barry Cable is more polished. I just can't imagine knowing Cave's attitude that if we were international, he'd be a superstar there too. He's proven he, that he you know, is one of the greats of all time in our game, which goes back 121 years, I think. One of the greats of all time, and that in itself uh, should be enough, but the, the question is on, on those other people. I say he's got to wait with him, you know, he's just got to. Because uh, well, he's done it for so long, I keep mentioning that, but little blokes usually, you know, they're, they're finished at 31, 32. Here he is, he's, what is he? He'll be 36 in the finals this year. It's absolutely incredible, absolutely incredible. He doesn't seem to have lost much of his reflexes. No, you've got to put him right up there with any Australian sportsman, I believe. In fact, the more I think about it, the more I'm certain that you, that you should. The legend of Barry Cable will continue to grow. His influence on the football scene and his example to young Australians will never diminish. Australian rules football is an important part of our life and Barry Cable's contribution to it is hard to measure. North Melbourne's Ron Joseph poses the view that we might never see the likes of Cable again. Let's hope we do. Our sport, our youth and our nation needs the Barry Cables of this world. Good night.